Hey, welcome back to the Red Letter Challenge Sermon Series. We're on week three, uh, day 13 of the Red Letter Challenge, and we're talking about forgiveness because that's what God brings us this week. That's what we know from being with God uh, as we learn more about how he works, who he is, and who we are in his presence. We know and we see that, that love from Jesus uh, coming through and how he, he sets us free. Uh, from our sin, uh, from the things that separate us from him and us from each other. Now, if you know about forgiveness, you also know about sin because you can't receive forgiveness unless you're a sinner. And uh, maybe you have your own story about this. I have several of my own. One that I feel comfortable sharing is about a time when I was younger and my sister, one of my sisters made this delicious blueberry uh, dessert. Uh, it had this uh, amazing topping that just kind of glistened as you looked at it, and it just looked so tasty. I just had to have just a little bite, so I just took a little bit off the top, and I walked by a little bit later, and I took a little bit more, and then a little more, and then a little more, and that's the thing about sin. Once you start, it's impossible to stop. And so by the end of it, I had eaten the entire top off of that blueberry treat, and um, no one else could have it. I had ruined it. Uh, I was so unloving to my sister. I was selfish when it came to my family, and, and I ruined it for everyone. Um, and rightly so, my sister was very, very angry at me. Um, and that's what sin does. It, it, it breaks everything. It ruins something special and something good. It makes it something unusable for anyone. Um, and so when we look at our text today from John chapters 7 and 8, the very last verse in chapter 7 and the first 11 verses of chapter 8 uh, in John's gospel. We see this story um, about confrontations, three different confrontations. First, uh, Pharisees confronting um, a woman they caught in sin and then uh, also confronting Jesus. But then Jesus confronting the Pharisees, and finally Jesus confronting the woman. Um, and so as we go through the story, as we go through these confrontations, think about what is confronting you in this moment. Are you looking at your sin just right in front of you and you can't escape it? Or are you thinking about somebody else's sin, how somebody else has wronged you or your community, and you want to hold them accountable? You want to make an example of them. So what's, what's sin um, in front of you right now in this moment? So as we think about, as we read through this story, we see uh, that the Pharisees uh, bring a woman to Jesus. And then Jesus is teaching in the temple again like he always does. And they bring this woman in. And uh, it's a woman they caught in the midst of adultery. And if you don't know what adultery is, it's uh, a, a man and a woman being intimate with each other um, who are married to other people. And the Pharisees caught this uh, man and this woman being intimate together. And sharing something that God only saves, he, he, he has it well placed in marriage. Um, and so the Pharisees is, are aware of this happening and they, they bring the woman uh, in front of Jesus. Now, two questions already pop out. First of all, why didn't they bring the man? And that could lead to some other questions like, was it because the other man was a scribe or a Pharisee? Or is it because they just wanted to trap Jesus and make an example of this woman and get rid of an unwanted uh, person in their community? And so that's the setup because they figure, well, either Jesus is going to say they should stone her and everybody would say, well, that's not exactly loving or Jesus will say don't stone her and then he's violating God's law Moses law and then every he'll lose his following and everything will be right with the world as they tell themselves these things and so as they continue on with this they present this woman to Jesus Jesus and how the seriousness of this situation this woman standing before him, the Pharisees vehement, asking, what should we do, Jesus? He, no, 
all of his wisdom and power bends down. He, he bends down and he starts doing something with his fingers in the dirt. Now, we don't know what it is. We don't know if he was writing something. We're not sure if he was drawing pictures of like trees and bunnies or something. But whatever he was doing, he was ignoring everyone in that scene. <laughs> he was just messing around in the dirt. Like what was happening was not of any importance. And they kept after him, and they kept after him, and they kept after him. Finally, he stands up and says, You who are without sin, throw the first stone. And those young guys, they were holding in there. They're like, all right, we're not as bad as this woman, so maybe. And so they're just kind of waiting. Like, do we do this? Are we doing this? Is this happening? And the older men in the crowd realize not only are they not without sin, but they've also committed the sin of lust. They've also fallen. You know, maybe they didn't commit adultery. But in another gospel, Jesus explains early on in his teachings that uh, to just look at a woman, uh, or look at a person of, an, of another gender with lust in your eyes, lust in your mind or your heart, that's the same thing is committing adultery. So we all stumble and fall there. We all fall down. And the older men in this crowd knew this, and so they dropped their rocks and split. <laughs> they, they, they let go of their perceived right for justice and, and left. And one by one, the younger guys in the crowd did the same thing. So there was a setup, right? The, 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 the Pharisees wanted to confront this issue of sin and really the issue of Jesus, uh, this false teacher in their midst that was stealing their authority, stealing their power, they thought. But Jesus saw this. He received their challenge. He received their challenge and he showed them that this is actually a deeper issue at work. There were three things in this issue that Jesus was confronting. He was confronting the issue of, of the hypocrisy of their judgment that he pointed out by saying, you who are without sin, throw the first stone. Had they stoned other people, other adulterers in their community? Had this happened before? This seemed like it was a pretty special case. And so Jesus saw right through their intent to try and trap him they saw, he saw right through their intent to set up this woman. And he goes on to confront the issue, not just of the hypocrisy of their judgment, but also the, the devastation of lust in their community. The Pharisees had no answer for that. They didn't repent in that moment, but they couldn't deny their own sin either. I wonder how often you and I come in to God's space, feeling good about ourselves, feeling blessed, we're God's people, we're his beloved kids, and we look around at some of the other people here and we think, well, at least we're not like so-and-so. That's not who God calls us to be. God calls us not to judge, He calls us especially to not judge the world. Otherwise, we couldn't live in it. But he also calls us to love, to show mercy and grace. And that's something the Pharisees lost sight of in their hunger for the law. They lost sight of the mercy and grace God has for them. He isn't treating them as their sins deserve. He's not casting them out of community and position and family because of their sins and their lust. And yet it was still... A tragic part of their community. But the Pharisees had no answer for it other than to walk away and give up on their trap of Jesus. The other thing Jesus was confronting was this misconception of mercy. How merciful, how patient, how loving God is in spite of sin for the sake of Jesus, for the sake of his promises, for the sake of those whom he's created, to 
be like him, to save them from their sin. They lost sight of God's promises, and so they lost sight of his mercy. And they thought by doing things right, they would keep what God had given them, realizing it was God and his power giving it to them all along, and nothing they did. And so, as the crowd leaves and disperses because they have no answer for sin and they don't know how to confess to Jesus in that moment, we're left with two people, Jesus and the woman. The woman is standing there, completely guilty. She was caught in the act of adultery. And she knows she's also being made an example of. She knows the community is condemning her. But right now in that moment, it's just her and Jesus. And Jesus looks at her. As God does to all sinners. All of us who fall short of the glory of God. Because all have fallen short of the glory of God. We are sinners. We are sinful from birth, from conception. But God sees you. He sees all sinners. He sees his beloved yet broken creation. And he sees this woman in the midst of this ridiculous, terrible, tragic moment. And he asks her, where are those who accuse you? Where are those who are bringing up these charges, who are exposing your sin to the world and to me? He says, where are your accusers? Is there no one left to condemn you? And the woman says, no one, sir. Jesus' question to those challengers and accusers, Jesus' presence and his power stripped away every challenge to his authority and every challenge to his mercy and grace. It's the power of God at work in this woman's life. That's the power of God at work in your story, too. And so he says this in Greek, Ude ego secrino. Neither do I condemn you. Now, in, in the Greek language, you don't have to say the word I. It can be part of the next word you're saying. But Jesus goes out of his way, and John goes out of his way to record it. Jesus says it specifically, I. And so repeating saying that word out loud makes it emphatic he's being very clear he's being very direct with her i don't condemn you either god's being faithful to his word he's saying i don't treat you like your sins deserve i'm setting you free and so jesus sees this moment that's a setup for him a, a moment that's a set a setup for this woman and he transforms it by his power by his mercy by his grace and so it's not a woman who's set up now it's a woman who's set free jesus is setting her free and as he says these words to her he follows up with this he says go and leave your life of sin have you ever longed for someone to speak those words to you? Jesus is speaking them to you now. Go and leave your life of sin. This is not who you are. Not only have I created you for something different, I'm redeeming you for a new life. And I wonder what that woman did. Did she leave her life of adultery? Did she go back? even in the midst of the community that would never forget what she's done. Could she move on? Did she dare to move on, to live like that day never happened? That's what the power of God does. That is what the power of forgiveness from God does. And that's what God does in our midst. In this place of worship, in the, the places we gather around this building, even and even when we can't gather, right? So this is the Sunday uh, that we uh, uh, kept our numbers smaller for the sake of the coronavirus. This is during the week, the, our first week of not having classes here, uh, not having Bible studies here, uh, changing our gatherings here. 
guess what, church? You are still God's church. You are still people who have been forgiven by God, uh, people who have got God. Look at them and say, go and leave your life of sin. God who looks at you and says, you are set free. You are my beloved child. You are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter. I set you free from your sin. Go and lead a new life. So yeah, we, we can't gather in this building right now. That's true. But we have the power of the living God inside of us. Power that sets us free every day. Power that sends you out with the spirit, with the word, with the knowledge of God working through your stories to set other people free. You are charged up. You are filled with God's spirit, whether you know it or not, whether you feel it or not. So let us get out there and give the people what they need. In this week of the Red Letter Challenge, you're going to talk about, or we're going to read about the sin that we do, the sin that we hold on to, the sin that we confess, and the sin that we forgive. And we do all this with our sin. We, we recognize the sin we do, and we recognize the sin we hold on to. Uh, we we take moments to confess our sin. We take moments to forgive other people that, their sin. But we do all that only and ever out of the power of God that forgives us first. We love because Christ first loved us. And that is how the law is fulfilled. Jesus loves the Father, and he loves the Father's beautiful yet broken creation. My sister and I moved on from the blueberry dessert incident. In fact, we're, we're pretty good friends even now. And sure, time can help you forget and get over things, but only God helps you truly to forgive. And my sister's forgiven me. Can you forgive someone who has wronged you, even worse than eating or ruining your dessert? Can you forgive someone who's ruined your relationship? Can you give someone that's hurt you? Can you forgive yourself for the ways you've hurt, harmed someone else? Can you dare to place your hope and trust in the forgiveness of Christ that makes you new? So it's not the law that makes God's story known. It's not the list of things that we do to, to make God's story known. It is the love of Jesus present in you that changes you, that transforms you, that sets you free. He set that woman free from a, a community of accusers and dared her and empowered her to live a new life. What is God's grace doing for you right now in this moment? How does Jesus give you the freedom that redefines your life? It happens three clear ways here. One, it happens through God's word, which is why we use it in so much stuff, in our readings, in our worship, in school, in conversations, in publications. God's word has the power to give us his grace, and that's why we use it. That's why we need it. That's why we call uh, so many, uh, so why we call this a way of life. But it's also God's word is present in baptism. We had two baptisms this weekend. Two kids who were claimed by the love of Jesus. We also have uh, God giving us God giving us his word through communion. His word comes with his body and blood, with the bread and the wine. And that gives us grace that we need to sustain us between uh, between worship times. So receive God's grace. It sets you free. It fills you with his power to love and forgive others. And so let's set to work, church. Let's set to work forgiving people this week of working through some of the grudges we're holding on to, working through some of the sinful ghosts of our past that we can't seem to let go of and place our hope and our trust in the God who saves you and the God who's present with you now and he's speaking the words, go and leave your life of sin. Don't walk away like you have no answer, like the Pharisees. If you're not sure what to say or what to pray, 
All you have to do is pray these words, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And if you pray that prayer, know that God hears your prayer in faith and he forgives you. And if you have prayed that prayer, I am obliged. It is part of my job, but probably the best part of my job to tell you that in the name of Jesus and by his authority, I have to tell you that your sins are forgiven. They're forgiven. They're gone. You are free. So let us go now and live in that freedom. Amen.